Hello and welcome to the bestseller experiment where we continue to discover what makes a bestseller and inspire you to start, finish and publish your book. I'm Mark Stay and Mr. DeVoe is still off uh, for the moment and we send Mr. D all our love and good wishes. Uh, but we do have a guest co-presenter this week, uh, the author of historical fantasy, including novels The Way Home, The Ivory Gate, The Seven Hills, as well as the Viking-inspired serial Tooth and Blade, whose uh, audiobook is just fantastic. He produced and directed that. You may have seen, it, seen him at the Oz Comic Con. You've most likely heard him on the podcast before. He edits my short stories and self-pub stuff, and he knows all my bad habits. Also, he taught Greek and Roman history at the University of Queensland, which makes him the perfect co-host for this week's special guest. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Julian Barr. Julian, welcome to the podcast. How are you? I'm fantastic, Mark. How are you? Tickety boo, thank you. Thank you so much for stepping in this week. And I could not imagine a better week. Uh, the author we've got this week is one, it's such a treat to to speak to our, our special guest, but also this is this is right up your Roman road, isn't it? Simon Scarrow. Oh, you bet. I can't wait. Excellent stuff. Well, Simon Scarrow, our special guest, is probably best known for his series, The Eagles of the Empire, that began in 2000 with the first book, Under the Eagle, and it features the Roman soldier heroes, Cato and Macro. The latest in that series, Death to the Emperor, is the 21st book in the series. Uh, Simon has also written novels about Napoleon and the Duke of Wellington. The Siege of Malta has written contemporary thrillers, he's, and he's now back with a second war- Berlin wartime thriller, Dead of Night, and we talk about both those new books, Death of the Emperor and Dead of Night. So we discuss planning versus over-planning, why authors need to learn to trust the reader, and he's got some great tips for research and collaborating with other writers. So do please enjoy. Simon Scarrow, welcome to the bestseller experiment. How are you today, sir? Very well. Good, good, good. Now, you're such a prolific author. We've not got one book to talk about today. We've got two. Uh, not least, we've got Death to the Emperor, which I believe is the 21st book in the Eagles of the Empire series. Uh, and then we've got Death, Dead of Night, which is your second Berlin wartime thriller. I think what I'd like to do is start with Dead of Night, and then we'll come to the Eagles of the Empire in a moment, because that is, is such a phenomenon. But this, this is absolutely fascinating to me because you're you're writing about uh, a criminal inspector Horst Schenker I believe his name is who is an honest cop in a criminal regime and he's he's an expert in an era when expertise is resented by those in power which sounds all too familiar but tell that us about <laughs> so tell, and it's the follow up to blackout which is the the first novel in the series so tell us about dead of night and and blackout the the story behind it how how did these come about well, um, they came about actually uh, as an idea for a novel I was going to write that was going to be set in Alderney during the Second World War. Ah. And because uh, I've been going there for a number of years to the Literary Festival, which, um, in case uh, the other writers listening are interested, is one to get yourself into because right. it's, it's, I think it's the best literary festival anywhere that I've been to, frankly. Um, partly because it's it's so sort of compact and small and that you probably the, the speakers outnumber the audience. <laughs> but it's the kind of island where, you know, you throw a stick, you're going to hit in the audience an ex-spy or something from the SAS or a, 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 some sort of senior banker or something, because they all seem to retire there. And it's a, mm. an absolutely fascinating place. But it's also um, the only place where there was a, on British soil during the Second World War, where there was a concentration camp. So um, I thought, wow, this this is uh, quite interesting, you know, because it's, it's a lovely twee little island. It's very much like Curran Island, actually, um, by Ina Blyton. That's what it reminds me of. Right. <laughs> so rocky, you know, rocky coastline, forts and castles, and you know, seagulls swirling around them, and uh, these beautiful beaches and clear water and so on. Um, and I thought, well, what an amazing setting, because it's only three and a half miles long and a mile and a half wide. And there were something like 6,000 inmates of the concentration camps and 3,000 German soldiers, you know, packed into this island. And I thought, well, what a, you know, a lovely kind of closed setting for a a murder mystery, Mm. you know, set during this time. But then um, I thought, okay, so the guy who's going to investigate this is going to be a cop sent over from Berlin to, you know, to to see what's going on. And then I realized that this would actually have to be a punishment 
because that's what happened. You know, you were sent to Alderney if you'd done something wrong. <laughs> Bit like in Coventry, I guess. But um, so what happened was I thought, well, I'd better do some research into Berlin and see what it was like being a, a police officer in Berlin. And what could this guy have done that would be so bad that would get him sent to Alderney? And in the process of researching that, I thought, there's loads of stories here. You know, it's just a most incredible setting, as you say, you know, trying to be um, an honest person in a thoroughly corrupt and brutal uh, dictatorship. Mm. You know, how do you kind of manage that? And I thought, wow, blimey, you know, th- w- what a setting. <laughs> so, I mean, the Alderney book will appear later in the series. Right, but um, I thought, well, the best thing to do is just start in, at the beginning of the war and write the series through it. So as the war develops, obviously, you're going to have more rationing, you know, bombing, you know, all these sorts of things. And in the background, the news of what's going on um, and how people are kind of developing strategies to live under fascism during a war, mm-hmm. this sort of thing. So, um, you know, it all came from there, really. And uh, I, I want to try, if I can, to extend it just past the end of the Second World War, because I think when the city is in ruins and, you uh, you know, it's an occupied uh, uh, nation and so on. There's still a need for law and order. But how mm. do you do it, you know, in a from a highly bureaucratic, functional dictatorship to complete ruins? You know, there's got to be, and someone's struggling to kind of keep law, law going in, at that time. So I, I do have a broad story arc uh, worked out for this. Um, and, you know, it's not as if the Nazis don't provide plenty of subject matter. Yeah, quite, exactly. As, and when, when you say you've got a broad story, I, I often find this, um, certainly readers tend to have a misconception that you have every single story beat planned out until the end of the series. But when you say broad story, you've, you've essentially, you know, the war, we all know the war ended. Yeah. We all know there was chaos at the end of the war. You're kind of, you've got a vague finishing line that you're heading towards, or do you know the specifics? No, no. It, it, you know, this is one of the things that... Um, it took me a while to realize as a writer is that, you know, it's wrong to over plan. Mm. So I know, you know, that, that's just a, you know, a, a, my personal take on it because I know writers who do and they're very, very successful. But, um, you know, I like to see, you know, I know where a story is going to be set. I know roughly what period it will cover. I know who the, you know, maybe the villain will be and what the problem is to be solved and so on. But up, everything else is up for grabs. And as you're writing the story, you know, things happen that surprise you. Um, characters will say things and do things that um, you think, well, I didn't see that coming. Yeah. If yeah. you overplan it, of course, then, you know, I was I was watching um, a television series on BBC last night with David Tennant and uh, Tushi, Inside Man, I think it is. Okay. It's called. And it's a sort of crime thing. But the point is, it's so obviously everything is structured around the idea that the author, the writer has had for this crime and how it's going to work out. And everybody's going to be forced, you know, yes. into that into that rut, mm. and and you you can feel it. You can feel that there's that this is just ludicrous. People are doing things which no normal person would do, and reacting in ways no normal person purely for the purpose of you know the plot that's been worked out for it. And I think you know readers begin to see through that. And I think mm. there's a line. Um, I saw it. You know, I make I make a note of these things occasionally. But there was something that Robert Frost once said. Um, and he said it was no tears in the writer, no tears in the reader, no surprise for the writer, no surprise for the reader. Mm. <laughs> think, yeah, absolutely. You know, that that's kind of how it has to be. When you're writing a book, you need to be by, surprised by the material. Mm. You know, if you aren't, then there's a good guarantee, you know, good possibility the reader won't be. Yeah, very, very true. Very true. Now, this certainly, you know, uh, Blackout and Dead of Night, no shortage of surprises and thrills in here. But I, this came with your your publicist sent over re- your research notes for this. Mm-hmm. This book goes to some very, very dark places. I mean, we're we're talking about you know the Nazis experimenting with the murder of people with disabilities and mental illnesses, and it's incredibly disturbing. One of the conversations we've been having on the podcast recently. It's about this idea of maybe going too far. You know, it, can you ever go too far describing these things? And how do you keep the reader engaged without overwhelming them or, or putting them off? And here you're talking about possibly the most evil thing of the 20th century, and 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 it's all done in such a calm and calculated way as well. The, you know, this this the Holocaust didn't happen by accident. Um, so, how conscious are you of? overwhelming the the reader with with too much of 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 this kind of horror well i, I you know there's 
I mean, you say, yeah, yeah, the Nazis, you know, the worst thing that happened in, in the 20th century and stuff. And you're thinking, yes, that's true. But I think there is a kind of convenient way in which they are, you know, I'm not scapegoating is, is probably too strong a word for it. <laughs> but for example, um, the, you know, the Nazis, when they came to power, very much bought into the idea of compulsory sterilization. So, you know, um, uh, mixed race people, handicapped people, et cetera, et cetera. And so they had a whole raft of people. If they, if you didn't fit into the, you know, the blueprint for the heron folk, you know, basically you were fair game for this sort of thing. Mm. Um, what tends to get overlooked is the fact that other nations have been doing this on a pretty industrial scale themselves for, mu for much longer. United States, for example, Denmark, Norway, Sweden. You know, we think of Scandinavia as this kind of liberal um paradise so you know perched on top of the north of europe whatever but you know norway didn't stop compulsory sterilizations until the 1970s you know and that's quite an eye opener wow. so you know when you look at the the numbers of people who are you know being forced into this process the nazis you know weren't alone in it and somehow you know nazi germany becomes this catch all for all those sorts of mm. evils that go on and it's very nice and you know easy for us to project all this stuff onto you know nazi germany and say hey but the rest of us were pretty cool weren't we? <laughs> you know? and, th and then there was a um a conference two years before the, the war broke out when it was quite clear that you know nazi policies were having a, a pretty unpleasant effect on the jewish population in, in germany and there was an international conference that was held in in Switzerland to decide, you know, what to do with the Jews, and and a lot of nations were represented there, and none of them was prepared to help out. You know, they they were absolutely riven by anti-Semitism themselves, mm. and you know, and somehow Nazi Germany gets the you know everything bundled on it on that story. That's not to say that they weren't, you know the most evil regime I think in history, and and I and I. They, they are, I think. I, I can't think of anything that tops it when you look at what they do. And there's another aspect to that, which I thought you know, is, is a pretty dark thing, but you know, we're all too familiar with it in, in various ways in the, in, in the modern world, which is the way that people who are involved in, in the Holocaust in a very kind of incremental way, so somebody developed the gas, Somebody developed a design for the the um, extermination chains. Somebody designed the crematoria, and you know they knew kind of what they were doing, but nobody told them, you know, in specific detail. So nobody had to sort of own up to that. And if you atomize the guilt and the knowledge, people begin to sort of find ways of coping with that, and they think, well, I, you know, oh, I just did this. I did. How was I to know that this was the way it was going to be used? And a lot of these people had very, very successful careers after the war. Albert Widman, who was the guy I mentioned in the book, uh, who was working for the um, forensic department, forensic research labs in, for the CREPO, the Criminal Investigation Police, was a guy who sort of seconded to come up with the design for the first gas chambers. You know, and afterwards has a very successful career as a scientist in a paint company. You know, this this is this is kind of what goes on. Mm -hmm. and it's the same with, um, as I say, more modern types. I had a good friend at university who was doing a research degree funded by Dow Chemical to make napalm burn more furiously under better conditions. And I sort of said, you know, how you know what this is going to be used for? Yeah. And he said, well, you know, I'm I'm more concerned with the problem of how to get this chemical reaction to be more, you know, expansive. And I thought, well, yeah, but you know what this will be used for. And he just somehow managed to compartmentalize that. And I think, you know, this is one of the scariest things, I think, of totalitarian dictatorships and bureaucracies, mm. is the degree to which people can absolve themselves from the big crimes by claiming only a small part in it. So is that, coming back to the original question, do you think that compartmentalization is something that the reader does? It, you can put those horrors into a fictional setting and the reader can go, okay, I'm I'm at a distance from that. That's not happening to me. Therefore, I can engage with it. Is is? Mm. Do you think there's something in that? Um, no, really, because you know, one of you, you writing a book and reading a book, you know, there are two parts of the same process. So, if, if a reader, you know, a re reading is a very creative act, and if you do it well. You know, then you kind of become part of the setting that's been related to you. And reading is a skill, I think. You know, this is mm. one of the things that's very much left to one side. Everybody goes on about, oh, well, look at the, what the author's done. The author's basically put black marks on white paper. What the <laughs> reader does is put those, you know, take those black marks, you know, and then mentally projecting this thing in their head. And if they're good, 
they really create a, a, an experience for themselves. So, you know, the, you can't really, if you're a good reader, distance yourself from the content of the book. And I think mm. if the book's any good, um, then, you know, the reader and the reader's good, then it's, it's this thing, you know, you start with uh, another little, you know, Robert Frostism, is that you start with, he's, he's talking about poetry, he says it should start with delight and end in wisdom. Now, I think, you know, if from writing, I think the same thing. You know, you start with a, a crime novel, and by the end of it, I hope the reader's going to think, crikey, you know, this is what totalitarianism looks like. This is what happens if you don't, you know, if you take your eye off the ball as a citizen in a democracy, you know, and the, hopefully that's kind of something people take away from it at the end. Wonderful. That's a great answer. Thank you so much for that. Let's talk about the Eagles of the Empire series, because... I was there. I was. I used to be. I used to be a salesperson at Headline when your first book uh, in the series uh, came out, Under the Eagle, which was two thousand, I think. Yeah, yeah. And this is the twenty-first novel in the series, Death to the Emperor. And what what must be so wonderful about this for you is I read a. I was doing some research. I was looking at blogger reviews, and there was a blogger who's who had read the twenty-first book. They said I've not read any of the others, and I loved it. And I I got straight into it, and I want to read the rest. Now, after 21 novels in a series, for a reader to come to the series completely cold and to feel, you know, completely at home with it and not feel like they're missing out on anything, and then to go back and read the others, there must be a knack to that. How do you do that? That's Tell us, Simon, tell us. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, as a uh, midwife to the process, you'll, you'll be you'll be in on the ground of this one. But um, we both know Marion uh, Donaldson, my editor, mm. and she's always said, look, you know, whatever you mm. write, um, you have to make sure that somebody can come in from the cold, pick it up and read it. And, you know, they'll enjoy it for the for the book they're reading. But at the same time, hopefully we'll get them to buy into the whole macro and K2 universe. And um, and it's like anything, isn't it? You know, if, if you follow a series um, and you, you, you become familiar with the central characters and so on, you begin to care about them. And I think there's always a really terrific payoff when you discover a series for the first time. Uh, wherever you sort of slot into it and, and start reading it from the beginning. It happened to, with me for Hornblower. Mm. Um, the first book I read was actually the first one he wrote, which was um, The Happy Return. Uh, and then he sort of went back and did the pre-start novels and then, you know, the stuff that happened later in Hornblower's career. But following, you know, a character across a series of books, you know, is a very, very rich and more rewarding experience, particularly if the characters grow. You know, if they are the same from book to book, I mean, I, you know, no disrespect to Lee Child, but Jack Reacher is Jack Reacher is Jack Reacher, you know. Mm. Um, and with Macro and Cato, you know, there's, there's a, the point at which um, Cato suddenly gets promoted over the top of Macro. And, you know, how do you deal with that new dynamic? And these are things we're familiar with. I mean, when I was um, uh, teaching, there was a guy, a student of mine, who was really, really good. And then when I left the college I was teaching at, he took over the department and I went back to see him a year later. And he was a hell of a lot better than I was. And it was a real interesting moment where very bittersweet, where I thought, I'm really proud of his achievements. But at the same time, you know, I feel humble that he's actually taken it much further than I did. And I think, you know, so then that sort of fuels Macro's uh, relationship with Cato when he kind of thinks, you know, here's the guy I raised up from a squaddy and now he's my superior officer. Um, how do I kind of relate to that? <laughs> and, um, you know, so I think if you kind of layer in these personal uh, moments in your life, which I think are common to a lot of people, you know, into the narrative, then these are people you grow with. And, you know, 21 books into the series, 21 years of writing this, you know, anybody who's kind of following the series is now as invested in Macro and Cato as I am. Mm. And every time I sit down to write a book, and I, I had no idea it was going to be 21 novels, I thought a dozen at best. Um, you know, it's it's like going on holiday with old buddies, really. You know? <laughs> and um, and I'm an amanuensis, and, uh, you know, they, they get up to shit, and I'm saying, slow down, <laughs> slow down, I've got to get this down on the floor. <laughs> And it's like, you know, you're, you're sitting there at the fireside with them when they're doing their banter, mm. you know. And uh, when that happens, it's that thing about, you know, Robert Frost says again, you know, you've got to feel um, for your characters. You've got to feel with them. And you've got to, you know, have their fears, their ambitions, their, you know, their emotions and stuff. And if you can do that, and, and, some, and it's quite moving sometimes because they'll do stuff and you think, oh, blimey, that's pretty horrific. 
And if it shocks you, then there's a good chance it will shock the reader, mm. you know, and they'll go along with it as well. So, yeah, I mean, you know, 21 books. Um, I don't see it ending anytime soon. <laughs> very good. Very, very good. Now, <clears throat> were there any... I, I, I read somewhere you, you said you envisioned your readers. You had a very clear idea of who your readers were as the bored people from the city of London on the train home. Yeah. Is, is that or, t- or t- on t- to work. Or going to work. Yeah. That, the yeah. Kind of the, yeah. Tell us where that come from. Because so often writers, we write for ourselves, I think, but very, very few of us take the time to imagine what our readers are going to be like. Did, how did that, where did that come from and how did that help you write the books? Um, well, was, I was thinking about my father actually, because he used to work in in the city, and he um, went up from or down from uh, Harlow to London every day, and he was always, you know, uh, reading a book on the train, reading yeah. a tri- you know, there to and fro. And he said that you know, sometimes he, you know, they would be chatting with some people he knew on the train as well, but most mostly he'd be reading. Mm. And I, you know, I remember talking to him about it. I said, "Well, how can you do that? How can you concentrate when?" You know, you're on a train and uh, there are other people and you know, it's all a bit sort of noisy and all this. And he said, he said, because it would drive me mad if I didn't have something to escape into, you know, to be in a different place mm-hmm. from, you know, where I was. If I if I just sat there and looked at the same houses going past every day, the same people in the carriage, you know, it would drive me insane. So I need something else. So I thought, you know, I thought, yeah, no, I get that. I get that. And, you know, this is one of the things I, I hear a lot from the readers is that, you know, for example, a lot of the guys were in um, Afghanistan, you know, in in appalling kind of temperature and discomfort and things and, and so on and danger. And they needed something, you know, to to escape from. You know, ironically, they chose to sort of, you know, swap Afghan for a war zone in ancient Rome. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I don't know how much that's escapism. But, um, but you know, it's that thing um, about needing a space away from where you are, I think. And, I, and, and that's how I kind of envisage it. And that's why I go to <clears throat> a lot of effort to go to the places where the book is set to get some sense of what the quality of the light is, the sounds, the smells, uh, the feel of a place, just so that I can transport the reader to it, you know, when, when I get around to writing the book. And a lot of people say that, you know, they feel that it's very kind of cinematic in the head. Yes. And, um, you know, that that's that's kind of you know, uh, the game plan. Really. I'd, I'd like to come back to your research in, in just a second, but c- coming back to Under the Eagle, the first book, were there any f- sort of full starts when you began writing? Because it, when it, I mean, I have to say you made my job very easy. It was an easy book to sell. It, it felt fully formed. It, it felt, you know, this, this, it was brilliantly written. It was really, really good page turning stuff. Uh, but did it arrive like that? I mean, obviously it didn't. How did you, how did you come to write Under the Eagle? Were there full starts before that? Were there dead end alleys that you went down? How did it come about? No, the, the actual first draft was very straightforward because um, I had written three previous novels with a very kind of cynical view of, you know, looking at what was selling in the, in the, in the shops and then doing something similar. And then, um, as I've mentioned before, I was a big fan of the Hornblower series and then Sharp was coming along. And I thought, I really kind of like following these, these guys through these, these experiences. And I thought, but I really what I want to read about is ancient Rome. Of course, nobody was doing that at the time. Mm. Um, the nearest to it was Lindsay Davis's Falco novels, yes. um, where she did a sort of worm's eye view of, of you know Roman society. And I thought, mm. well, that's what I want to do um, from a military perspective. And I thought, well, and I didn't, you know, think about writing it. I was looking for a book to read, mm. and there wasn't anything. Right. So I thought, well, you know, I'll write what I want to read. So, you know, and this is why I say, you know, you can't overplan these things. You know, you have to feel. There's an authenticity in the story that you're telling and an authenticity in why you want to tell it. You know, you can't just do it because you know, you're looking at your bank balance. You have to do it because you're passionate about it. So that's how I got started on that and, and, and you know, wrote the, the first draft pretty quickly. Unfortunately, it was 150,000 words long. Right. And my first agent said, you're going to have to lose 50,000 before I submit it to headline." And um, I thought, well, you're kidding, a third of the novel. I mean, but this is brilliant stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Wendy Suffield, who's the, the first agent, said, yeah, but you're going to have to lose 50,000 words. No two ways about it. You know, get to it. <laughs> and it was a real liberation because you know, I was going through it. There were whole chunks. There were scenes. There were storylines. There were characters who all sort of kicked out. And I, and I was 
heartbroken, you know, to lose this material. But when I looked at what was left at the end, I thought, wow, this is pretty mean, you know, it moves along at a fair old pace. And there isn't, doesn't feel like there's much fat here, you know, and, uh, you know, bless you, Wendy Suffield, for teaching me to edit, frankly. <laughs> Did that affect how you wrote the the following books as well? Were they just as lean in their early drafts, or or, or do you overwrite and then cut back? I think um, as you go further into a series, and as my you know understanding of how Marion operates becomes more sophisticated, <laughs> um, you, know, you begin to sort of write with um, her leaning over your shoulder, virtually, as it were. So as I'm writing, I'm thinking, you know, uh, uh, if, if, if there's any kind of hesitation, I think, okay, so what would Marin's take on this be? Um, and it's, it's not kind of writing to order. You know, there's a reason why she's been an editor, a successful editor for as long as she has. She's good at her job. Mm. And one of the things that um, it's, it's been quite funny over the years is when she sends her editorial feedback, my first reaction is outrage, you know. <laughs> and, then, and then I sort of go, well, she's half right. And then I have a cup of tea and a biscuit. And then I go, oh, maybe 75%. And uh, the next morning, it's kind of 90%. And typically, I say, Marion is about 95% right, you know. And there's a reason, as I said, for that. Um, and now it's, you know, I can, I'm, I'm in pretty good place in order to sort of second guess her on. on and, and it's useful, actually, to have that kind of interior dialogue going when you're writing. Because... You know, it saves time. And also that question you asked earlier, you know, if, if you go over the top, because you, you could do, and you're thinking, well, you know, okay, this is a very kind of unpleasant and difficult scene. Um, how would somebody else react to this? So, you you know, you, you think about that and you think, okay, well, does that require any kind of change then? Um, because, you know, I've read some pretty grim stuff in my time, uh, crime novels and uh, horror novels, and you think, you know, I really didn't need to know that detail. Um, <laughs> and it hasn't improved the book knowing it. And you know, some of this stuff is is the stuff of nightmares, frankly. Mm. Um, and you just, um, you know, is it important to put it in there? I think sometimes trust the reader. You know, they they, they don't need it. You know, painted in unsparing detail. It's like you know that, that, that movie Alien. I noticed you got your Star Wars figurine on the background. Yes, so we, can <laughs> we can talk science fiction. We can. You know, the beauty of Alien was that you didn't get to see the guy in the rubber suit yes. until right at the end. Mm. And you had no idea what shape it was, you know, throughout yeah. the movie. And I think you know, that's that's what's far more frightening than, you know, the guy in the rubber suit. Yeah. So, um, and, and it's the same thing in books. You know, you don't want to sort of like plaster all the details there and leave the, the reader nothing to do because I think they probably hate it, they, you know. They may reject it. B, they'll probably feel a little bit insulted that you haven't trusted them to come up with the goods themselves. There's a, there's a lovely Billy Wilder quote, which is said, he said, if you let the audience add two plus two, they'll love you forever. And I think that's, yeah, um, yeah trust the reader is, is, and I think you've said in the past as well, I, once I was, I was looking at my notes, you, you, I think you said when you're writing, you're enjoying it vicariously for the reader. So does that mm. come back to that Robert Frost thing as well about delighting yeah. the reader? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, yeah, because we're all readers as well as um, writers, and you know, you will, you will imagine actually you'll imagine something in a particular way as you're writing it. But when you read back over it, um, it does come across sometimes as different from the way you intended it when you mm. wrote it. And I, and I thought and that's quite an interesting moment when that happens because you think, ah, you know, so this is what you know the reader's going to experience. You yeah, know? and uh, and sometimes you think. Um, well, we can tweak that and make it even better. And sometimes you think, well, maybe we shouldn't put that bit in. <laughs> yeah. um, but it's an interesting, you know, I'm, I'm not a great fan of rereading um, my own writing, to be honest, because it, it's always a work in process when it gets published. That's how I regard it. I don't think there's such a thing as a finished novel. Mm. Um, you know, there's a, there's a novel, that's, every novel I think is at least one or two edits short of where it should be. Um, and no novel will ever be edited, perf you know, to perfection. Um, and I think, you know, because of that, when you reread stuff, it's actually quite painful um, mm. because, you know, the hundred and thirty thousand words that the reader gets when I when I, when the when the novel comes out um, are only the end point of a whole series of choices and possibilities and directions the story would have gone, all of which I've got up here. Yeah, and sometimes you think, well, wouldn't it have been better if it went that way? Yeah, or you know, I'm not actually convinced by this now. 
you know, yeah. sort of, even though the readers go, oh, yeah, it's great, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. because they don't see that process. Yes, you, you know how the sausage is made and it's uh, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. very, 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 very true. True. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Having worked as a student in a, in a chicken skinning factory <laughs> um, and knowing where um, chicken McNuggets come from, I can tell yes. you. <laughs> you don't want to know. Yes. Let's go back to your research because you are, you know, you are steeped in research, particularly in Roman history. And I know you've been inspired by the writings of 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 uh, you know ancient Romans. Do you still need to go back and dig for details? Is it a constant process of, of research, or is there a point where you feel like yeah, I, I kind of know this? Um, well, I'll be honest with you here. The research is the, is the best bit. You know, right. when you're you know traveling, seeing places, taking notes. Um, reading books, talking to reenactors, all that, all that sort of stuff is, is absolute magic. The problem is stopping it. And that usually happens at a point where Marion will call me and she'll say, Simon, that book you're handing in in, in two months' time, how's it coming? <laughs> um, and that's the point at which the research stops, actually. And I sort of settle down and, with um, uh, industrial strength coffee and peanut butter sandwiches and get on with the job. Uh, literally, <laughs> peanut butter sandwiches. Excellent. Yeah, crunchy <laughs> has to be crunchy, um, and um, so it, it, it's yeah. I mean, the, you know, the research is very, very important. But I think um, but the point at which I start writing is when I put it all to one side, um, and I don't refer to it as I'm writing because the danger if you kind of stop, go to the, the source, you know, your your research material, and then come back. Is you know the danger is you'll do an info dump, and that is also one of the more disappointing aspects of some historical fiction. Is when somebody feels they have to give you a lecture on something. So um, I try to you know my my view on this is that okay I'll do all the research, and I'll assume that the reader knows exactly what I do, and um, therefore you can just drop it in as it seems natural mm -hmm. you know, in the course of a conversation or, or discussion of a particular place, um, but no more than that. And if they're interested, they'll either, you know, if there's something they're not familiar with, they'll, they'll work it out from the context or, or they'll go away if they're interested in, and look it up. In 90% of cases, I guess they just kind of go, oh, you know, that's something I didn't know. I'll read on. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's important, I think, not to take, you know, to do those pauses where you take the reader out of the fiction and say, here's the lecture. Now let's go back. Yeah. Because that that really kind of destroys it. Um, and, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a basic Error, I think a lot of people who start out in writing writing do. Um, somebody lent me a, a book they'd written uh, recently. There were seventy pages of exposition before any dialogue, and um, you know it's not that they hadn't done a very very good job of world building. They had. It's not that they couldn't write, but it's just that they they couldn't they didn't yet know that you know all the world building and stuff is something you do before you sit down to write. And the key thing is the story and the characters, you know, and I, and I think that's a sort of bit of a tyro mistake that a lot of people make. I think it comes back to what you're saying earlier again about trusting the reader, trust yeah. the reader to, to put these things together. You mentioned uh, reenactors. We were talking to Christian Cameron recently. Oh, right. Uh, okay. And uh, he, of course, he takes part in reenactments. Mm. He dresses up. He does, he does it all. Uh, ever done that or any chance of you doing that, Simon? Um. No. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I've got all the kit and um, I have, you know, you try it on sometimes just to see what the weight feels like and uh, what the movements, what movements are possible and how difficult it is to clean all the sort of, you know, nuts and bolts and stuff like that. But, um, you know, that is a, all credit to Christian for finding the time to do it. Um, you know, but when I'm writing, you know, two and a half books a year um, and I'm also, dealing with moving from one country to another and things like that, then, um, you know, you, you don't have a huge amount of time left for anything else. Uh, so they're very, you know, I mean, they're always interesting people to talk to because they, they have hands-on experience of, you know, wearing the kit for several hours a day and, yeah. you know, the, the discomforts that go with that. But also things that um, I went to Chester where they're building a, a Roman auxiliary fort up at Chester. And uh, there's a guy there who, um, some reenactors who had a, a Roman catapult and I was really interested in the loading process. And then once they loaded, everybody kind of backs away from this thing. And I said, well, what's going on? And the guy said, you know, just get back. And I said, why? He said, because 
these things, the arms break every so often. And when they break, you know, this thing flies around and it can kind of break ribs and stuff like that. The, yeah. the broken one. So, you know, I thought, I mean, uh, you know, there's something you don't know unless you, you, you've seen a yeah. catapult infection. So the very next book, of course, you know, that, you know, that, that gets fed <laughs> into it. Well, because it's, it's, it's just something that, you know, it, it's a bit, you have to move away from Hollywood where no uniform is ever um, grubby. Mm. Um, you know, everything works flawlessly and everybody goes around in this kind of nice degrees of uniformity in, in terms of their, their dress. No, the Roman army didn't look like that. The British army in campaigning in Spain during the Napoleonic Wars didn't look like that. They looked like tramps in fairly short order. <laughs> you know? um, I think, so, you know, you need to kind of reflect that. And, I, and I, reenactors tend to be the best people to go to, you know, for that sort of thing. And, there, and there's also a strand of um, his, historian as well, Peter, the late Peter Conley, um, who wrote this fantastic book, Greece and Rome at War. And he debunked, I mean, it's really, really f- interesting talking to him. He's a, a real grouchy old character, but <laughs> so, you know, on the, on the ball. So there was this thing that you read when you're a kid that, uh, oh, yeah, the Roman javelins are designed to sort of go through a shield and then bend so nobody could throw the javelins back. You know, ooh, and you think, well, and this is one thing my, you know, classics teacher told me, and I thought, well, that's really, really clever. And I was talking about this with Peter Conley. He said, well, of course, it's bollocks. <laughs> <laughs> he said, well, he said, I, I spent two years um, making these javelins, trying to get them to do what the ancient sources said and throwing them at sheets of plywood. And he said, it doesn't, it can't happen. <laughs> he said, I tried everything, you know, but it doesn't work. And he said, the reason why they have that long, thin um, iron point, uh, you know, shaft behind the iron point, is to pierce the shield far enough to skewer the guy behind it. No other reason. Right. And you think, well, unless, you know, you do these things practically, sometimes the ancient sources aren't the most reliable. You know, sometimes yes. these, the archaeologists and the reenactors try these things out. You know, for example, everybody makes this, this mention about the marching yoke. Um, and there's a guy called Derek who's in the Ermine Street Guard who spent years trying to work out how the Romans could possibly fit all the kit they needed onto a marching yoke uh, and then have it arranged in such a way that, that if there was an emergency, they could get their kit on really, really quickly. And, you know, he finally came up with a version of the yoke that, that could do all this. But, you know, until he did, who knew? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You mentioned earlier you do two and a half books a year, which is extraordinary output, I think. And your website, I love your website, because if you go to the website, rather than just um, list all your books, you have a surprise me button, which I love, where you just click randomly and it brings up three random books. I'm going to do it now. There we go. Ah. Okay, this is interesting. It's got two two eagles of the. Uh, it's got eagles of the empire, a pirata book that you co-wrote with T.J. Andrews, playing with death that you co-wrote with Lee Francis. You you've co-written a lot of books as well. What? How did how did that come about? Um, well, it started with um, Tim actually, uh, and it was it was a headline marketing idea. Um, somebody said, "Oh, wouldn't it be really good if we did this sort of like a." Uh, Serious thing with a end of boss level at the end of each novel, and then the big boss at the end. And it, I, it was sort of as crass as that. And then I sat down with Tim, and we started talking about. It and we thought, well, this could be a lot better than this. And uh, we've worked on four. We're, we're working on our fourth novel now, which is, um, I think, one of our best. Um, I think it's the best of the things I've written with Tim, but also I think it stands up pretty well in terms of the whole thing because it's about Caratacus. So it's the whole thing, you know, redone from the British perspective, Britain, you know, the ancient Britain's perspective of the invasion mm-hmm. of Britain. And we're having a huge amount of fun with that because it's it's Caratacus in Rome at the end of his career, defeated and telling his story to a Roman historian who knows he's going to have to make it fit Roman expectations. Um, and at the same time, you know, wanting to, you know, so it's that thing of history. You know, you, there's a story you want to tell. There's a story that emerges from the facts and the interviews, and there's a story that you know you can get away with. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that's, you know, that's kind of how history works. So we're having a lot of fun with that. Um, Lee was actually one of my former students, and we were we planned out this television series, and we've got a producer attached. It was, but you know how these things go. It takes forever for anything to happen. Yeah. Yeah. And I said to Lee, look, we might as well write it as a novel whilst we're, rate, you know, we're waiting for the, uh, the TV deal. And I said, and if we do it as a novel, then we can sell the rights to the novel. We've also got four seasons of 10 episodes 
for each season, pl- you know, plotted out, and we could probably get a you know a gig writing some of the scripts. So, so we, potentially we could get paid three times for this. Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's that's how we sort of uh, got round to writing that. And do you enjoy? You clearly enjoy the co-writing process. Are you exercising different muscles from when you're you're working alone? Well, absolutely. I mean, it, it's it's a, it's fascinating um, in the way in the differences because. I love being kind of locked away with Macker and Kato or Horst Schenker, you know, and their world. That that's really kind of immersive. But quite, you know, what's really nice about co-writing is it's not like both of us sit down at the same word processor and argue over who's going to hit the next key. You know, it's mm-hmm. not like that at all. Um, I write the first, you know, chunk of the book, say a uh, fifth of the book or whatever, hand it over to Tim um, and Lee. You know, when I was working with Lee, and then they will kind of change my bit add the next chunk and send it back. Right. Um, and occasionally we will, you know, meet up and, and discuss, you know, issues to do with with um, the plot or a particular character or any, anything we think, you know, needs more discussion between the two of us. And if you find the right, it's a bit like marriage in a way, if you find the right partner, um, you know, the conversation flows, you know, the, the you know, everything works really, really nicely. And, you know, Tim will say something and I go, wow, that's brilliant. You know, we've got to have that. In. And then because he, he said that, I think, and that would mean that this, and he goes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then of course, you know, there are the moments where you go, but that doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> So you have these kind of, um, but it, it, it's really good. And, you know, I couldn't do both exclusively. I couldn't just be a, a co-writer and I couldn't just be a, well, I suppose I could, I, I did it for long enough. But, you know, I enjoy both processes. Um, and, I, you know, it, it's like, as you know, as we talked about earlier, you know, the writing's half the process, reading's half the process. Mm. But it, even with the writing side of it, there's the editor involved, you know, there's publicity, there's marketing, there's legal bots, you know, there's all sorts of things. So, you know, I think on balance, things are much, much richer because there is this kind of collegiate approach to the whole yes. process. Um, and this idea that, you know, the, the writer is the be all and end all of the, of the book, you know, is, is something I, I don't think is terribly helpful. Mm-hmm. And you do meet writers who, who, who believe that and think they are kind of, geniuses and um, <laughs> and uh, and those kind of people are best avoided at parties um, <laughs> because they will talk about themselves <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> i've met a few yes yes <laughs> uh simon this has been absolutely brilliant so what's coming what's coming in the future are we seeing more uh berlin wartime thrillers and we'll definitely be seeing more eagles of the empire is there anything else coming that we should be looking out for yeah yeah well i'm, I'm starting a writing a musical which is Oh wow! <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, all the music's been done, unfortunately, but it, it's just um, it's for because uh, um, we we moved recently to Mauritius, and my wife is back with a band that she sang with in Geneva twenty odd years ago. Um, they've retired there as well, so you know, so they're, and they're now gigging together and so on. Um, and this is an interesting band because they had um, the first ever image, the first ever pop video on the internet. And the reason for that is because they were, the guy who ran the band was working at CERN, where Tim Berners Lee was working. Right. And he was you know, designing the internet. And he came back, you know, into Savano's office one day and said, Look, I need an image and I need a video to test this new thing out. And uh, so, so he said, Well, here. Yeah. And so they, you know, they became the first things on the internet. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there's a, there's a really interesting story there. Um, and it's a you know it's, it, but there's the human things of course about the band across the years but you know the reason why I think that there's a sort of a, a possibility of making this interesting is because of that that particular history. Fantastic, brilliant. Well, we'll keep an eye out for that, um, folks. Simon's got one or two books that you can catch up with there. So, uh, and I would say I would say Death to the Emperors is good. A- place to start as any and, and blackout and dead of night as well so do check those out simon scarrett thank you so much for speaking to me today it's been a real pleasure hope to speak to yeah, you again soon Mark. good to see you again after all these years <laughs> <laughs> what are your writing dreams finishing that book quitting the day job becoming a best-selling author well over four years we've studied the advice of over 300 best-selling authors who've collectively sold over half a billion books And we are excited to announce the Best Seller Academy. If you're ready to take your writing to the next level with accountability, craft and coaching, your bestseller dreams are now only a click away. To find out more and apply, visit bestsellerexperiment.com 
forward slash academy. That's bestsellerexperiment.com forward slash academy. Whoa, how about that? That was an amazing interview, Mark. He's great. I could have chatted to him for a lot longer as well. He's he's one of those guys who um absolutely fascinating. Uh, and and if you watch the YouTube version, you'll see in his office there's just props everywhere, bits of, you know, the, weapons and uniform and helmets and all kinds of stuff as well so yeah he's he's an absolutely oh. fascinating guy i've only got one one sad little greek helmet in my um <laughs> in my study <laughs> yeah well haven't we all um let's, let's talk. <laughs> the thing the thing that the thing that really jumped out at me first of all was this idea of him visualizing the reader as the mm. bored commuter on the train home which i thought was just such a it's something that um we we say don't write to market, you know, but and and you should write the book that you really really want to write. But once you've done that, having an idea of who is going to read it is really going to help you hone the edit, isn't it? Is this something that you do, Julian? Yeah, it's something that I. Uh, what what really struck me is he's he's writing the kind of book that he wanted to read. Uh, mm. That you know at at the time, uh, Roman. Um, kind of military historical fiction wasn't really a thing. Uh, it was very much focused on things like I Claudius, the Emperor's memoirs of Hadrian, um, quite um, often quite kind of highfalutin uh, intellectualizing books, uh, but he really got into the nitty gritty of uh, life in the legions. Um but he didn't necessarily do it because he thought it would – well, he, obviously he thought it would sell. Otherwise, why would you? Uh, but it was the kind of book that he wanted to read. Mm. Um, and, and I guess to me it really shows if you are passionate about something, if you want something, other people will want it too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He understands his reader because he is that reader. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Or at least his dad was talking about his dad being the bored commuter on on the train home. And when it came to selling the book in, and I didn't, I didn't really want to go into this too much, just because I thought he might be appalled with how I sold the book in, because it was, I have to say, the easiest sell uh, of that year. I remember it very, very clearly because it had this wonderful cover, sort of sandy cover with a map and a sword and kind of Roman stuff on there. And I would go into bookshops because I was a sales rep. I'd be driving all over the southeast of England and I'd go into bookshops and we had our little kit where we sold things in. It was one of our lead titles. We were all very, very excited about it. And normally with a lead title, you would sit down, you go into the plot and you go into this and you go into that and the reasons why they should buy it and this, that and the other. And I would say, th this is the year 2000, and I would say to people, you saw Gladiator? And they'd nod. <laughs> And I'd say, you know the opening 20 minutes? And they'd nod. I'd say, it's that. It's that in book form, and it's a series that's going to run and run. And they go, sold. And they buy it. Back then, we had what were called dump bins, which were these cardboard structures mm -hmm. that you put at the front of the shop where you had 24 or 36 copies of the book. And they go, yeah, give me a bin. And it was just, it was just the easiest. And that's because I think... It was he was thinking of that reader. He was thinking of uh, you know the kind of people who had seen Gladiator, and as you say, there was a huge gap in the market as well. People weren't writing books like this necessarily, uh, and it just slotted into place and sold like the gangbusters. And here we are, you know, twenty one books later, and, and he's he's still going strong. Yeah, yeah, no, it's amazing. What really uh, amazes me too is how long the series has been going for. H how many books did you say? It's uh, 21 novels. And 21 novels. Fantastic. Yeah. And this is the thing, you know, how do you how do you keep readers coming back for more? You know, uh, it's it's and it's interesting. He made, he made the connection with Jack Reacher. I mean, the Jack Reacher books are still going strong, but the character mm -hmm. of Jack Reacher pretty much stays the same. You know, Jack, Re it's, it's the environment where Jack, Jack goes to a new town. There are new villains to overcome. Um, and that's what Jack Reacher does, and then he moves on to the next town. It's, it, that That's the model that works. Whereas with these, he was saying that with each one of these books, the characters do grow and evolve and change. And, you know, the, the you know in, in this 21st novel, they're going to be different to the people they were in the, in, in the first novel. But 
yeah, d- but doing it in such an incremental way that you can still come in with each new novel. Yeah, yeah. And that takes a real skill and uh, a real artistry to do that, I think. Um, I, I think he kind of baked it into the premise uh, in, in a way because he focuses so intensely on uh, the characters and their relationships to each, each other. He must know these characters like the back of his hand. Mm. Yeah. Or perhaps yeah. better. Yeah, it's interesting uh, the, the idea of baking it into the premise in that they they must what we we talked about you know surprising himself and surprising the reader and keeping mm. the reader engaged and that kind of thing and uh, we're going to talk more about the reader in in the extended edition but this idea that you give them room to growth to room for growth to start with I think mm. that's you know if you are thinking if you're writing something and it's book one in the series, you've got to give them somewhere to go. You've got to, and I, I was very very aware of this with the Witches of Woodville series that I couldn't have Faye as a fully fledged witch with all her powers and everything go. And also emotionally, she's quite. I mean, what a common criticism of of the Crow Folk is is that she's quite immature, and that was there was an intent behind that because mm. she needed to grow up. She'd been quite naive and quite shielded and hadn't you know not very worldly so by the time you know i've just delivered the fourth book to my uh my editor and oh, well she's done. thanks she's um <clears throat> and she's you know grown up considerably from the um from the first book uh, in fact one character makes makes a mention of it so yeah i think if you are if you're listening to this and you're thinking well i've got an idea for a series that could potentially at least you know three books four books five books or whatever will run and run i think it is important to give characters somewhere to go how i mean you've written trilogies and series how are you aware of that when you're sitting down to write for the first time oh, oh yeah i um <laughs> i'm working on something at the moment which is basically a, the premise is designed to run and run um mm-hmm. and uh essentially the main character will go on a very lengthy journey uh but each story is still self-contained um uh it's a little bit like the Jack Reacher series where, you know, a character does sort of go from town to town encountering different villains. Um, and yet I don't want the character to be the same person at the end that they were at the beginning. Yeah. Um, I want to reward readers for sticking with the series. Uh, and that's something I am very mindful of while also trying to make each book a self-contained adventure that you can pick up without yeah. having to do a bunch of homework uh yeah. beforehand yeah um that's what spooks me about very long series to be honest yeah, yeah. um it's um it, I, I i'm going i'm going through exactly the same thing and each each of my adventures i want to be each of the woodville books i want to be a standalone story i want you to be able to pick them up and where there is some kind of back history you usually just need a couple of lines to acknowledge it. Someone will mention it, and uh, mm. you know. I mean, the the cheapest version of that is when you used to read Marvel comics, and Spider Man and Doctor Octopus would say something, and it would be in an issue that you've not read, and there'd be a little box. It would say, "See issue two hundred and sixty one, Ed," and you think, "Oh, okay, I should really get." Now we can't do that in novels. Uh, not as literally, anyway. But you can kind of go, "Well, all that business last year with so and so and the thing." Let's put that behind us, so you can hint to the reader and go, "Oh, there's more to this. Oh, I can, I can. Mm. There's a richer kind of history to this that I can, without making the reader feel cheated that they're not in on in on the joke or anything like that." Mm. To to um to sort of sidetrack slightly, it, it reminds me in television. Uh, I, I remember when sort of serialized television um, was hailed as the as the second coming. Um, uh, and people would talk about, oh no, it's not really a season of television. It's a 10 hour movie split up into 10 parts. And, um, it's rubbish, honestly. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I, I hate that kind of television. I really like the, I really like going on a, uh, on, on a journey with, um, a character, of course, but splitting it up into chunks that are digestible and which where each one stands on its own. Um, I, I like shows like that. It's it's part of the reason why 
I think Star Trek Strange New Worlds has been so successful yeah. um, compared yeah. to, say, oh, Star Trek Picard has been very divisive, for example. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah, each yeah. one of those episodes works on their own. One of the things they do tell you when you're uh, working on a pitch for a TV show is um, write episode one, the pilot, but also write episode three because Ooh. that's that's where the show has momentum. That's where the show mm-hmm. is already up and running. And frankly, it's where a lot of new viewers might casually wander in mm. and go, okay, what's this about? Oh, I see. It's about these people in a spaceship going from planet to planet, discovering new worlds. Oh, that sounds cool. I, I might go back to the beginning. I might continue watching it from here. So that's mm-hmm. quite a tricky thing to pull off. And I'm aware that, you know, people who might pick up the third of my books should be able to pick it up and go, what's this about? Oh, it's about witches and it's the war. Oh, and mm-hmm. there's more of them. Let's go back and start. Uh, I mean, I I remember uh, I remember read, picking up just randomly because I'd ne- never read him before, picking up a Bernard Cornwell uh, mm-hmm. novel from the library. And it was the it was one of his uh, Uther ones, you know, the, the the series that he did. And it, I only found out later it was book five in the series. But I mm. totally, you know, there was a bit there's char- roster of characters at the beginning. There are some maps. There's a little bit of context, and you're off. And I and I I think Simon's books are exactly the same. Whereas you can just go, okay, these guys, these Roman soldiers, it's just another day for them. There's a new challenge to face. There's new new things to to conquer. Um, so yeah, it's. Uh, I think you've got to be. Whereas in a trilogy, a trilogy is very much a beginning, middle, and an end. Yeah, but even so, yep, those yep. should still work as their own kind of story. You don't want the the second book ending on too much of a cliffhanger, especially if you've got to wait eighteen months between books. But you know, but yeah, it, you've read a trilogy. In, yeah, yeah. Uh, with um, Ashes of Olympus, um, I kind of approached it so that each one had a very distinct tone um, and feel to it. So the the first one is very much an adventure story. The second one, <clears throat> The Ivory Gate, uh, is very much a tragedy. It's a character-driven um, romantic tragedy, actually. Uh, the third one is a war movie. It's, sorry, it's a war story. Mm. Um, but what amazes me is people being able to pick up the third one and just read it yeah, without having read the first two. And I kind of sit there going, how on earth are you doing that? But apparently they like it. Yeah, that's a good sign. That is a good sign. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, we can talk about trusting the reader in the extended version as well. We'll, we'll come back to that in a minute. Mm. Um, well, I, I was also really interesting uh, to, to this thing of uh, – Getting paid three times uh, for for yeah, his work as well. I knew you were going to. I knew you were going to raise that. <laughs> that's. I mean, you know, we're in a time where certainly in the UK, authors' earnings are, are really, really down. Um, but there are opportunities. You know, you get paid for the novel, you get paid for rights, and if you're lucky, you might get paid for the screenwriting rights as well. You know, so it's. Uh, mm. But he had a he had a script idea which he'd co-written, and then decided, you know what, let's let's turn this into a novel because movie movie making, TV making can be incredibly slow. So if you if you haven't sold it that yet, then yeah, do go back and consider writing it as a novel. It's um, uh, it's something I've done hasn't quite worked yet in terms of selling the rights and then getting something made, but it's certainly been on yeah. my mind. Look, no, writing is wasted. Um, and as long as you keep keep writing, sooner or later you'll find find somewhere for it to land. Uh, that's just, just kind of my philosophy. I, I'm, gl- I'm really glad you said that because there are a couple of things I'm working on at the moment where I am thinking, God, am I wasting my time? You know, <laughs> is this actually going anywhere? Is this going to land anywhere? But you're right, because even if it doesn't, make it onto the screen or into a book you have learned something on the way about yourself and and learned something about uh the craft um because there will be novels that i've you know i've got loads of scripts and novels and stories that haven't seen the light of day may never see the light of day and i know when you're starting out it's difficult to hear that but Mm. um it's the truth i mean is that has that been the case for you julian have you got stuff that's that's Never, never seen the light of day. There are things that will never see the light of day. <laughs> um, actually, it's interesting connection to Simon. The very first novel I wrote was a werewolf story in Roman Britain. 
Wow. Um, oh, sold. Yeah. <laughs> oh, look, I love the premise. I still love the premise, and I will come back to it one day. But I, it was the novel where I was learning to write, and guess what? It's complete dreck. Um, <laughs> I think that I, if I was going to tackle it again, I would need to start from scratch, right. basically. Yeah, I've got a few. Um, yeah, yeah. And look, I've written... Uh, I've written screenplays. Um, I've written pictures for TV shows. I even directed a short film once as a mm. um, uh, as a kind of a, a sample to kind of entice producers. And everybody looked at it and went, well, we love it. You're an excellent writer. We have no idea how to sell this. Yep, I um, that as well. <laughs> yeah. I... I'm just kind of looking at that script and the story won't go away. Um, and I'm thinking of redeveloping it into a novel. Um, um, it, it's, it's an idea at least. You may, you know, I mean, the, this is the thing, the idea, the idea of a werewolf in Roman Britain, really exciting, very exciting. Uh, but there is, particularly when you're starting out as a writer, I think there's too much weight given to the idea. I've got an mm. idea. This is an amazing idea. But so much <laughs> of it is is about the execution. It's I mean, I I I we on the podcast recently we were talking about digging out old stories that never and Mr. D was quite keen to see some of my old dirty laundry. I did find a screenplay from about 20 years ago. I had a sort of time travel idea. Uh, mm. Where we had dinosaurs rampaging through the streets of London, uh, and it was, you know, it was it was very Doctor Who actually. Uh, I was just thinking of that. Yeah, and it was, you know, there were great ideas, but it just didn't hang together as a story. There wasn't anything in that that mm. you know, there was no the characters were cardboard. The 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 themes were really thin, but it had some cool dinosaurs and you know and other stuff and and that had Roman soldiers actually uh, you know marching through the streets of modern London. So there were images, why there not? were flashes, exactly. But it, well, why not? Is because there was no bloody story. That's why it just <laughs> didn't work. So you know, it's um, ideas are a, a kind of a dime a dozen, but it's it's so much of it is to do with the execution, isn't it? Yeah, it's interesting you say that. I, I sort of come to the conclusion that all ideas are worthless. It's just that some ideas are more worthless than others. Um, <laughs> well, look, let's let's talk some more about uh, stuff in the extended edition. We're going to talk in the extended edition about overplanning, uh, reading as a creative act, research and reenactment, and working with editors. And look, if you're listening to this and thinking, hang on, I want to listen to the extended edition, well, the extended edition is for our sponsors. It's the people who keep this show going. It's our academates in the Bestseller Academy, and it's our patrons on Patreon. And we simply could not keep the show going without beautiful people like you. And now, what do you get when you support us on Patreon? Well, if you become a chart topper supporter, you get access to over 120 deep dive and special episodes and subjects like blog tours, writer burnout, TikTok editing, copy editing, screenwriting, book launches, writing sex things. That's a good one. Networking, well building, YouTube, much, much more. We speak to experts in their field, including agents and publishers, and all that stuff is there for you to access at any time as a chart up a supporter on Patreon. So just in the last couple of weeks, we've had deep dives. There's one with myself and director John Wright. We're talking about the development of our film, Unwelcome. Uh, we've got a great episode with Jack Renanson from the new Bookerchill Fantasy Science Fiction imprint, Second Sky. He's talking about what their editors are looking for, how to submit to them, pitching, all that good stuff. So if you want to find out more about that, go to bestsellerexperiment.com forward slash support become a chart topper supporter on patreon or sign up to the academy if you sign up to the academy you get to join the most supportive community in writing you get me and mr d as your coaches mr d does writing uh life coaching and i focus on craft there's loads of courses uh, to help you become a better writer i have a weekly writing surgery on zoom you can have one-to-one -one sessions with me and you get all those deep dives, which we have a special app for that. Uh, you can dip into them anytime. So to find out more about that, go to academy.bestsellerexperiment.com. Uh, there's links in the show notes for you to find those. Okay, over on social media, lots and lots of good news. And just this morning, uh, on the day of recording, the Romantic Novelists Association of the UK, they announced their shortlist for their 2023 awards. And it's 
Two of our members of the Best Cell Experiment family have been nominated. So we've got Jeevani Chirika and Lorna Cook. So uh, Jeev, oh. uh, her, yeah, it's, Jeev has been uh, shortlisted for the Jane Wenham Jones Award for Romantic Comedy for her novel Playing for Love, uh, which is available now. And uh, Lorna Cook has been nominated for the Historical Romantic Novel Award uh, for her book The Dressmaker's Secret. I also know that Jenny Keogh, who's a listener, her, her novel, The Legacy of Hailsham Hall, is in the same category. So congrats to uh, to, to all of you. Uh, absolutely amazing. Again, if you support the podcast, these are the kind of people you're going to be mingling with online. Just the absolute best. Lovely, lovely people. So uh, congrats to you folks. Um, also on social media, I'll see if I can find a link to this uh, that I can share with you as well. Kate Baker uh, ha- did a lovely unboxing video for her new novel, Made of Steel, which I highly, highly recommend. Uh, it's um, it's it's lovely because you see the moment where she sees her book for the first time and it really is quite something. It really is uh, very, very sweet. Uh, I just had a, a lovely little note over on Patreon as well from Sasha Green talking about our episode with Cole Haddon, episode 424. Uh, a discussion about genre. She says, some really interesting discussion about genre in this one. I think when you're starting out as an author, it's much better just to write what you want and then work out what genre to market in. Obviously, once you've decided what genre suits you best, then you can write to that. But if you choose the wrong genre to start with, I think you can stunt your creativity. Also, and this fascinated me, regarding the discussion on chapter lengths and editing, dividing a book into chapters is the absolute last thing I do before a book goes out. So after all the editing is done, I find it saves me loads of time as I'm not having to rejig them all the time. Sasha, that's a brilliant idea. Huh. Have you ever tried anything like that? No. Wow. I had not even occurred to me. That's fantastic. That's, it is, yeah. I, I'm i stealing that. Yep, me too. <laughs> um, another bit of good news, again, for someone in the BXP group, uh, uh, GB Ralph, Gavin Ralph, uh, who, a new novel, Murder on Mil- Milverton Square. He's an author from New Zealand. Absolutely brilliant, sort of cosy crime. Uh He's seen his book in a library. He's just been added to his his local library in Palmerston North City Library. And it's a wonderful thing seeing your book in a library for the first time with that little sort of plastic wrapper around it and everything. It just feels there's something about it. Certainly, if like me, you were going to libraries a lot as a kid, that's such an important Mm -hmm. milestone in your journey. So congrats on that, Gavin. It's brilliant news. Have have you seen your book in a library with that little plastic wrapper, Julian? Oh, yes, yes, I have. And um, I I was just quietly got my pen out and went to sign it and I heard this librarian, what are you doing? <laughs> you depraved man. Get the hell out of my library. <laughs> and, and last but by no means least, this is actually from a future guest on the podcast. I've recorded this interview already and it is one of the strangest, one of the most wonderful interviews I've done. It's a very, very strange, strange book. It's a book called Dear Mr. Popstar, where uh Dave Philpot, who isn't a real person, writes to pop stars like Nick Kershaw oh. and points out the the illogic in some of their their pop lyrics. Anyway, he's got the rights back for his book. He's he's uh, he's re-edited it and they've put it out. And it's the book is just if you've got a pop fan in the family, this is the perfect gift. This is the perfect book for them. Um, the difference now uh, with this new edition. Uh, they're donating a percentage of the sale each time to Crisis, which is a brilliant homeless charity in the UK, which um, I, I, I I give money to as well. Um, so I'm going to put links to that. Uh, Dear Mr. Popstar, this is a new edition by uh, Dave and Derek Philpot. It is absolutely hilarious. So uh, we've got a special interview with Dave Philpot coming in a few, a few weeks' time. So do check that because the way this book came about is just absolutely extraordinary and it's such a such an inspiring uh, episode. Well, look, if you've got good news, drop us a line. Uh, come and find us. We're at bestsellerexperiment.com. There's a contact tab there. Uh, on social media, we're all over the place. Uh, Facebook is Bestseller Experiment. Twitter and Instagram is at Bestseller XP. Drop us a, a line there. And if you've enjoyed this, please subscribe, rate and review. Give us a rating. Big thank you to our editors Dave and JD as always Julian where can people find you online uh, jbarauthor.com um, I think is that's j-b-a-r-r author.com um, yes is is uh, I, I still am not decided on whether I'm keeping my Twitter account but I'll always be there 
Exactly. Uh, we'll put links in the show notes so you can find those. Julian, thank you so much for stepping in this week. Of all weeks as well, I think it's been uh, given us an uh, extra bit of insight into Simon Scarrow and historical fiction and all that good stuff. So I really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. My, no, uh, uh, it's been a joy, absolute joy. And uh, listeners, thanks again for listening. And until next time, happy writing. And it's a goodbye from Mark 1. And it's a goodbye from Mark 2, Mark 2. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs>